Hey everybody, uh, my name is CK Umachi, one of the organizers of the Stanford Blockchain Club. Uh, today we have with us Clinton Donnelly. Uh, Clinton is the owner of Crypto Tax Audit, uh, where him and his team provide uh, tax solutions, protections, early audit warnings, and a bunch of things uh, related to crypto taxes. I personally uh, saw Clinton give a talk uh, with another group earlier this summer, and I learned a ton of it, a ton. I've been trading since 2017 and got a lot of gems on how to think about how my personal taxes are happening. And I know right now there's a lot going on with DeFi, with NFTs, that people are dipping their toe in the water, uh, trying to test things out. And no, there are taxifications that come from all this. So uh, we brought Clinton in today to be able to kind of expound on that. Uh, so Clinton, if you want to just start with introducing yourself for the folks who are uh, watching, uh, let us know who you are. Well, thanks very much, CK, for the introduction. I'm glad to be here talking to the, the blockchain group. Uh, a bit about myself, I have, a, I have an advanced law degree in international financial regulation. I'm an enrolled agent certified by the IRS to represent taxpayers worldwide. That's what I do. I have tax clients in 62 different countries. And uh, I have a team of people that work with me. I have a company of 20 employees. We pretty much focus strictly on crypto taxation uh, for individuals and businesses. So uh, we have a couple parts of our company. We do tax return preparation. We also have our own team of people who do tax gain calculation. You know, how much did I gain from my trading? What was the income I earned? And then we also have, uh, we defend people in audits. I'm currently defending uh, 20 people in audits before the IRS on their cryptocurrency income. So that gives me a unique perspective, I think, in terms of seeing what the IRS is doing, how they look at things. And that feeds back into our tax preparation process. And we do things differently uh, as we understand how the IRS is looking and how they work. We do things that reduce your likelihood of being audited. So I think we're, we're kind of trailblazers. We also have the ability to monitor and let you know six months in advance when the IRS is auditing you because we can monitor your IRS accounts and see those flags. So a lot of exciting things and I'm uh, excited to be here to talk to you guys. So fire away. Awesome. And so you can kind of just start with just level setting us to what are the broad, uh, and I know it's a very broad question, but kind of what are, what are the broad crypto tax implications? So for folks who are just dipping their toe in the water, they probably want to know one, when, a, what is a taxable event? So maybe let's start there. Like what is a taxable event and what's, what should people be thinking about as they're trading or doing anything in the crypto space? Absolutely. Well, first of all, the IRS considers cryptocurrencies to be property. They're not currencies, okay? So with property, you make income with property uh, when you sell it, okay? You experience, whenever you dispose of property, uh, whether you trade it for, uh, you know, whatever you trade it for, you experience a gain or loss from what you originally acquired of that. And that's what you get taxed on. That's the gain. Some, a, a loss is simply a negative gain, if I, in case that anyone gets confused on that point. Whether, if I have a crypto, let's say I have Bitcoin and I trade it for Ethereum, that's a taxable event because I disposed of the Bitcoin. It doesn't matter whether I traded that Bitcoin for Ethereum, another stable coin, or for fiat dollars it's still a taxable event on what I gave up, the Bitcoin in this case. So crypto to crypto trades are always a taxable event. I experience a gain or loss. Now, uh, when you have, when you do your taxes at the end of the year, all your gains and all your losses, offsetting losses are all put together to figure out what your net gains are. They're divided into two categories, your short-term and your long-term gains. Long-term gains are assets that you held over a year before you sold them, and they're taxed at a lower rate, which is a massive tax break. That's called long-term capital gains tax rate. Uh, short-term uh, gains uh, on assets you held for a year or less, they're taxed just like ordinary income uh, in, on your marginal tax bracket, except there's no uh, you know, social security or self-employment tax. It's just regular income. So those would be the major aspects about how it's taxed. Now, income also occurs when I have rewards. Uh, broadly speaking, rewards might be airdrops. They might be uh, staking rewards. That might be rewards from you know, putting money in a liquidity pool uh, a, or some other service, a, a, uh, a faucet, all these types of rewards, the, the IRS wants to treat as income at the fair market value in US dollars on the day that you receive them. In general, that's the, the basic concepts. Awesome. That is super helpful. Um, so I guess 
as people are navigating their trading, uh, do you have any advice for people to on how they should be thinking about their trades on a day-to-day -day basis? Because I know a lot of people do either high frequency trading or they buy and hold and kind of any just best practices for people as they're navigating their trading throughout the year to be thinking about the tax day, which is coming at some point. <laughs> well, CK, that's a massive question you just asked, all right? So, hey, look, there's no tax on hodling, okay? Uh, merely buying cryptocurrencies, there's no tax on buying it. You don't experience a gain until you dispose of it, okay? So if you genuinely hodled, then you're not going to have a tax. Now, if I had to buy Ethereum to go buy, you know, this other coin, well, then there's a gain on the sale at Ethereum, and then you hodled the other coin. Yes, that's good. But there was a sale on the, the uh, on the exchange of Ethereum. Um, in terms of uh, I mean, we, we should probably get in and talk about that question in terms of the category of DeFi and also in the category of NFTs, because the answers will be different. But in general, uh, as you make gains and losses throughout the year, the tax law says you should uh, pay the IRS estimated tax on a quarterly basis as you earn it. However, uh, you don't know really how you're going to earn, you know, I mean, you might have posted gains in the first quarter of this year, but then the the price has collapsed. You might have sold and had some losses. You might have paid too much taxes in in, in retrospect. Uh, so, you know, so the question is, how much estimated tax do I pay? I don't want to find myself in a situation where I don't have the money to pay it. In general, you want to pay it as you go, uh, on, you know, on a quarterly basis, you know. But, but if you don't, uh, the penalty you experience is 3% per year. So based, based on this, the IRS wants their money by April 15th. So if you don't pay it by then, you, pay, you don't pay a large amount by then, then they just kind of say, you owed me 3% of what you should have owed. Now, a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, I could put the money in BlockFi, USDC, BlockFi make 8%. Yep, that's true. You know, so it's a cost uh, of money type of decision each person has to make. Just remember, you don't want to gamble with your tax money too much. Awesome. And so how does the IRS get a sense of what an individual's tax implication is? Is this typically the person just attesting? And I know there's some rules where they can audit some of these uh, exchanges, but how does the IRS get the information to verify that what you're saying on your tax information is adequate? And if you didn't submit tax information, uh, that how do they track these? How, do, how, how could they track somebody down who uh, didn't? Uh, great. We could break that into a couple questions. So um, in the U.S., when a U.S. company pays money to somebody in excess of $600, they have to file a 1099 form with the IRS and they send you a copy. Uh, this basically reports that they had a disbursement and there's like a whole, there must be about 15 different 1099 forms. And the one that is commonly used by US crypto exchanges is called the 1099K form, which uh, is uh, kind of a an all-purpose form, and it basically reports the total proceeds uh, of your trading. So when I use the word proceeds, uh, so when I buy when I buy something, that establishes my cost or cost basis. That's the accounting term for that. When I sell it, uh, hopefully for a gain, that's the proceeds. Okay, that's what I got from it. The di difference is the gain. All right. So just want a little terminology there. So they, so these uh, exchanges will add up your proceeds and then they'll report that to the IRS. Now they're not adding up your gain. They're not telling you the IRS what you got. And it, it is a big problem because I have a lot of high, high frequency traders. I have one guy, he's a, he was a gamer, uh, did uh, 90,000 trades, 2018, came up with a $14 million worth of proceeds that Coinbase reported to the IRS. IRS got excited about this because he didn't report it. Uh, and we're in the middle of an audit. And it turns out that this guy pretty much lost money. So, you know, so the IRS is, you know, is has learned that uh, 2018 1099Ks are extremely misleading. But uh, this is the type, this is how they get that information. They're going to see that number. Now, let's say, you know, if this guy had filed his tax return and reported all the proceeds, he would have had that 14 million number already in his tax return. He would also have shown that he had 14 million plus in, in 
cost, right? But the IRS computers do a really coarse checking. How much income did you report? How much did the 1099s report? And if you don't report as much as they know about, you're in audit territory. So that's how you avoid an audit. Now, you to take that a little bit further, let's say I'm trading on Uniswap, okay? Or I'm over on SushiSwap. Coins are in, coins are out, right? Do they know about that? No, not really. Not until they've started an audit, not until they've asked you what your blockchain addresses are and they've dug in, then they would find out about it. So how would they be attracted to that? Well, at some point in time, you're going to want to take that Ethereum and you're, uh, that ETH, and you're going to want to cash it out. So you move it over to Kraken, Gemini, Coinbase, and you sell it for cash, all right? Or you do some trades with it there. Now it becomes visible because those companies are going to report 1099s to the IRS. You know, it pretty much if you ever want to get back to U.S. dollars, you're going to have to go through one of those exchanges. So that becomes the, the point of vulnerability, if you will, where the IRS can become aware of your trading activities. Awesome. And uh, so you mentioned DeFi and NFT. So I guess taking those two uh, broad buckets, how do those differ um, and how do how do those differ from all the like not before DeFi and NFT or a, a thing, all these other tokens that are outside outside of those uh, those two spheres? Like, is there any big differences, I, I guess, between the, the bucket? Oh, yeah. So we call uh, your typical like your centralized exchanges, uh, you know, Coinbase, Kraken, Binance. Uh, we these centralized exchanges, we call them C5 for for alternative word, you know, they keep their own records of your trading. They record that on a such such a date, you gave up this ETH for you know that Dogecoin, right? They, they have that. So then when we do your taxes, we just pull down those transaction records, which are, are pretty good to help us figure out what the, the cost in the, the sale prices were for reconstructing your capital gains. That's pretty good. Uh, although the, the more exchanges you have, you start to get problematic just because it's uh, some people's, uh, the more exchanges you have, the more trades you do, the more lost records occur uh, on that environment. But now when we go to DeFi, the line with DeFi is, hey, everything is written on the blockchain. It's all there. You know, you don't have to go to an exchange and pull it down. doesn't matter which protocol was working on it. It's all written on the blockchain. Well, as it turns out, uh, it's not that easy. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to calculate taxes uh, using on DeFi. Uh, and the reason is there's three general areas for the reason. One is the blockchain uh, does not track well uh, the tax implications of trades, all right? So there's no real standards for enabling the blockchain to capture tax information. Uh, for example, uh, on Ethereum, uh, there's roughly 170 different functions that can be done in terms of trading, each one of them having a separate tax implication. Well, that's just staggering. Every new company that comes out with a new protocol has comes out a whole new set of functions that they would do. And you know, there's no standardization on the tax implication. Is it a liquidity pool? Is it a yield farm? Was this uh, a interest, right? I might have put money in uh, to this contract, but another contract pays it back out to me or another address pulls it back out to me. So it's really hard to correlate the, the buy price and the sell price on a, on a particular asset. Um, so there's a lot of issues with the blockchain or should I say the protocols themselves, the the blockchain protocol doesn't force it to happen. Secondly, the tax laws are unclear. Uh, the tax laws in the US are very realization, realized gain based. Uh, however, DeFi tends to explore innovative financial structures that don't always result in realized gains. For example, a yield farm, you know, you might have uh, impermanent gain or loss happening all the time. And it's not really a true gain or a true loss that we could tax because it's it's in flux. And so we don't know until you close that position out if you've really experienced a gain, all right? Uh, so that tax law is, is vague in this area of derivatives. Uh, all the regulations in the tax law about derivatives and futures and those sorts of sophisticated instruments are all dependent upon things that are happening on regulated exchanges. Well, and this is an area where cryptos just run circles around the tax code because you know nothing's regulated. So this is a challenge. And then the big, cha another challenge we have with DeFi is the services that do the gain calculation. There's about seven of them right now. 
in the that that do gain calculation. They're big names, and uh, they're what we have been doing work and we have plugged in and found that the prices and the results from these vary vastly from each other. As far as I, we had one guy, uh, I was talking to him today. Uh, I happen to have the results right here. Uh, he made they disagreed on how many transactions he had on the blockchain. One said he had 938. Another one said he had 642, right? Now all the block, all the transactions are on the blockchain, but they disagree on how many transactions there were. One said the total proceeds he had was 17 million. Another one said uh, the total proceeds was 8 million. I have another, one of the services uh, actually generates a loss for this individual. Uh, they, these, this is the tax implications here uh, are varying by millions of dollars. All right. And this person only, he had less than a thousand uh, DeFi transactions, which if and he was a yield farmer. So that indicates that, you know, what we're seeing with these services is that they're taking shortcuts to get to answers, shortcuts. And they're also making assumptions about how to implement the tax law. They're breaking a lot of things that you and I wouldn't do. Uh, for example, if I stake my ETH uh, and then I get like a, I, 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 let's say I put my uh, ETH over into Aave and I get an A-Link coin, all right? A lot of these services will say, we just sold that. They will treat the ETH as having been sold or exchanged for the A-Link coin, all right? And then you do this and that with the A-Link coin, which they're going to generate taxable events. And then you come back, you burn the A-Link coin to get back the ETH, and they're going to treat that as another transaction. But in fact, you never gave up the ETH. It was always yours. There was never a sale. And this way of chopping it up into little events deprives you of long-term capital gains, which is one of the reasons why you invest in a liquidity pool or a, a, a staking, uh, you know, uh, yield farming, whatever you're investing is. You want to gather long-term capital gains from it all. And these services chop it up and the result, resulting is that you have faults and sometimes much higher uh, taxes. Other services, simply, if they don't know what the coin is, they just throw it out. They don't even consider it. So it's all over the floor. The complexity is staggering for these companies to wrestle with. And you as a taxpayer are, uh, how, I guess I'd say, uh, there's a lot of complexity, uh, confusion, and uh, uncertainty in how to do taxes. And, and the innocent taxpayer or investor itself gets in there, you don't realize what sort of quagmire you have rolled into. Uh, and when the IRS audits us, they're going to audit us like, you know, two years from now, three years from now, when there will be better tools, but we'd be held accountable for the tools that we have today. So, you know, what we're doing is we're aggregating these positions. We're documenting what all the services are saying so we can document the, the instability of all these services and coming up with the right number as a means of defending clients. Awesome. Hope That's I didn't super scare helpful. you too much there. <laughs> you probably scared quite a few people. Um, I guess so with all that in mind, um, so short of being audited and coming to a, 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 and actually going to pay for a service like yours, uh, as people are doing their year, like their year to year taxes, any, because it's not like based on what you're saying is that depending on which platform you go to, it could be broadly different. So I guess one option may be to try a few different ones out, just beat the cost of trying a few different ones out to make sense of what makes the most sense. But any other advice for, I guess, us, and maybe even if there's a specific platform that you've seen that's performed better than the others or, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, I cannot say that any of them uh, generate the best answer. It depends upon the situation, depends upon the coins you use. Uh, I hope that there'll be a convergence. What we're doing, and we'll be releasing this actually in, at the end of the month or end of September is we're going to be offering a service where we'll do all seven gain results for you. Uh, so that you can have uh, basically an inventory of what these are the different people said. And then we'll have a discussion in terms of, you know, what was your gut feeling, which one of these answers was closest to your gut feeling. And that would pretty much be the number you'd go with. Uh, and uh, so we're going to do a service that, that does that whole thing cheaper for you. So you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, and you have it documented as a third-party source that you could reference in the, in the case of an audit. So that's what we do there. I can't, I, there's a little bit of a leapfrogging. Each one's uh, doing improvements, but we're not there. We're a long ways away from DeFi. And that this is all just doing ETH. 
uh, network. I mean, next year we're looking at you know multiple networks, uh, and it, the complexity is it would it's just simply growing exponentially at that point. So it's going to be challenging for uh, for many years to come. I think. Yeah, I, I hear that. Uh, so kind of as, as far uh, as the DeFi, as far as the DeFi goes, as far as the CFI goes, uh, you know. The top services out there uh, are strong. You know, CFI, we got a Cointing, Zen Ledger, Token Tax, Coin Tracking, Coin Tracker, uh, Crypto Trader Tax. These would be, you know, favorable ones in the CFI space. Um, so that's for the game calculation. Gotcha, gotcha. That's super helpful. Uh, so kind of kind of taking a step uh, higher level, um, and you kind of touched on this in the presentation that I saw you give uh, uh, earlier this summer. So how have the crypto reporting and taxation laws changed? Uh, I know there's, there were some changes back in, I think I wanna say 2017, 2018. Um, and then also uh, there's been some, a uh, lot of things going on in Congress this year uh, with some, uh, some laws, laws passed that, uh, that uh, seem to have crypto tax imp, uh, implications. So can you touch on, touch based on like how the laws have changed uh, from 2016, 2017 through today? Great. So in 2014, the IRS came out and said, cryptos are property, have to be treated accordingly. All right. So no further guidance came out uh, until really 2019. In 2019, they came out with uh, a virtual currency FAQ. Uh, and some interesting things came out of that in terms of giving you a little bit more latitude in terms of decide using whether FIFO or LIFO for calculating which gain you had. And at that time, they said that airdrops uh, and hard forks were taxable events. Uh, and they may, every other than those events, uh, every time the IRS has spoken in informal capacities and such, they've generally stuck their foot in their mouth, to be honest with you. Uh, this year, they came out with a revenue ruling, uh, or uh, which, no, not a revenue ruling, it's a private letter ruling on whether or not cryptocurrencies could be treated as like-kind exchange uh, up through 2017, which was a rule that might have applied to cryptocurrencies. They said, no, you can't. Uh, it's, it's our position that that is a, uh, let's just say it's a weak, uh, a weak interpretation. It would not hold up in court, in my opinion. It's extremely flawed. And in, in my opinion, it's part of an overall concerted effort by the IRS to uh, do a little bit of psychological warfare on on crypto traders who might get audited in 2017. So that's coming out. In general, though, if you step back, uh, the US Treasury Department, which would be the one you'd want to have driving regulation, has been very slow. And our, I think the reason is, and it's the same thing, reason why you have this club, is that crypto, you know, blockchain technology is exploding in so many areas. And I, the US government has as a prior, a national priority to be the financial capital of the world and we will not be the financial capital of the world if we regulate crypto activity sooner than is necessary so uh, i think they're letting the having let it be a little bit of a wild west to promote innovation and the sorts i think that's the goal now we're hearing some stuff in congress right now some laws are being proposed as by the democrats uh, they can propose all they want uh i think from now until uh Later, you know, smarter heads will come to bear in terms of the crypto tax rules. I don't think um, we want individual representatives or congressmen or even the whole lot of them uh, determining what our crypto taxation rules should be, you know, because they're driven by expediency, whereas the Treasury Department actually hires intelligent people to think about this stuff. So I, we need to hold our breath. I think what we will see would be general changes in the overall capital gains tax rate. Uh, might We might lose long-term capital gains right off over a million dollars uh, and everything would be taxed at the short-term rates at that point. They're jacking up the short-term rates. Uh, they're jacking up a lot of things, but I don't think uh, you're going to see massive changes in crypto taxation by the end of this year. I, I personally don't think it'll be as radical as people fear. Awesome. Cool. Um, so I'm going to open it up to more q and I'm going to start with some of the stuff in the chat and some of the questions that were submitted. Uh, if anybody does want to come off of uh, uh, come off uh, mute and ask a question and come on video, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but with that said, I'm going to start with some of the comments and questions in the chat and then some of the ones that were submitted prior. Uh, so the first one is, 
Do cryptos apply the wash sale policy similar to stocks? No. Uh, the reason being, uh, that's my personal legal opinion. And we have an article on that at CryptoTaxAudit.com on the blog site. But if we dig into the wash sale rules, it applies to stocks and securities. Well, what's a stock and security? And you have to go jumping around between regulations and laws. And eventually you find that stock securities come back to ownership, uh, in, inter, ownership interest in a corporation. All right. Now, if you have a security token, though that might the wash sale might rule might apply to that. Like if you have a token that represents Apple stock, uh, then that would probably apply to that. But in general, um, no, it wouldn't. And then you get the issue as well: is a governance token the same thing as ownership of a corporation? Well, not really. I mean, you get the right to vote, but. It, that's d diverse from ownership. So uh, again, just examples of where the crypto laws just run circles around the old categories in the tax code. Awesome. And are the, what are the actual implications for uh, crypto traders uh, since there is no, no wash rule? Is there anything that can be gleaned from that? Well, uh, so you're free to go in and out of a coin uh, as often as you want. The wash sale rule says that if I dispose of a coin and take a loss, that I cannot buy that coin back or stock back uh, within 30 days, you know, before or after of the the sale the, the sale of the losing coin. And this could be very painful. If you do that, you lose the entire loss uh, that you're trying to claim, which could be very very painful. So to flip that around, you hear about this terminology called tax harvesting, or you know loss harvesting. So you can do that with cryptos. You can't really do that the same way uh, or as quickly with stocks. The idea of tax harvesting is, let's say we're coming into December, okay? And you're thinking, wow, you know, I want to lock, I'm afraid the taxes next year will be higher than this year. So I want to lock in my gains so I can sell my gains now. So I won't have to pay the gains next year at higher rates. Or how about losses? Like I've made a lot of money this year, but I have a couple of coins that just went down the tubes. I would like to sell those coins and harvest the loss to offset my gains so I don't have to pay as much taxes this year. But you might say, hey, I'm going to sell that coin that went down, but you know, I, I think it's going to come back. It might not be next year or the year after, but, I'm going to, but I'll buy it right back after I sell it. So that way I, I retain my same portfolio, but I've harvested the loss that had up till then been unrealized. So that's, that's what tax harvesting in, and that's how a wash sale rule comes to bear. Awesome, got it. And this is actually my uh, question for me. So what about in the case that you are either hacked, you send your tokens to the wrong wallet and now it's gone forever, you lose your ledger off, off of a, uh, a boat, <laughs> I keep hearing that, that term. Um, but if you end up losing your, 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 your crypto, and, and rather, if you, if you do lose your crypto, how is that treated or how should people treat that if you're hacked or you just send it to the wrong exchange or whatever? Well, there's a couple different ways. I mean, basically, it's a loss. Uh, when you invest in cryptocurrencies, you're you're making an investment in you're making uh, you're investing with the purpose of of making a profit. So it's different than if I if I lost my baseball mitt. You know, there's no. It's different because I invested for the purpose of having a, a profit, and therefore I can write it off. Uh, and uh, there are several ways to treat that. If you have, uh, let's say, a simple loss, I, I moved coins to a dead address, uh, an exchange closed on me, you can write those off on your taxes. You basically take it as a zero. You treat it like you sold it for zero dollars. Uh, we typically, when we do a tax return, we put a disclosure statement in which says this is what happened uh, so that we don't have to fight it later. Uh, if you have, say, a Ponzi scam, you invest in something and it's a rug pull of some sort, you know, and if you know, there, there, there might be, especially if somebody's indicted somewhere in the world, then you could treat that as a Ponzi scam and it complete, comes a complete deduction. So it's treated as a deduction, actually reduces your taxable income rather than your gain income. So there's a couple different options there, but there's uh, a silver lining in all losses is you get to write some of it off. So that's important to keep in mind. Awesome. That's helpful. Because I was going to ask about the rug pulls because a lot of times you'll still have tokens in your wallet. They're just unsellable at that point. Um, so that's good to know. So, so in that situation, at some point in time, it does, you know, it, at, at some point in time, you treat it as a loss and you write it off as a zero dollars. And then what we do in a disclosure statement, we say that when we do that, that should for some reason that coin, 
you know, rise up like the Phoenix, then we'll treat it as having a zero cost basis for future tax purposes. Awesome. And what about like uh, stable coins? Uh, let's start with, start with stable coins. What about stable coins? Uh, how are those treated? Because they are technically different from a fiat currency, but they act like one. Well, they treat them just like another cryptocurrency. Their property, uh, because they're a cryptocurrency, is still a property. Uh, the when you you experience a gain or loss, whatever you load them, it's going to be minuscule, of course, because you know it's stable. Uh, but uh, it's still a gain or loss event, uh, and you report it as such. Awesome. And a reminder: if you do want to come off camera and ask a question, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, there's a question here about taxing NFTs. Um, and specifically, what do I need to report as an NFT marketplace? NFT taxation is complicated because the exchanges where you might work on Rarible, OpenSea, Super Rare, uh, they keep transaction records somewhat like centralized exchanges. However, they keep very poor records and oftentimes they're unusable. So uh, they might be helpful to you to lead you back to what a sale price might be, but they're unusable in general. So we have to go to the blockchain. Uh, if someone only traded a handful of uh, like we had one client who traded, uh, he was a creator as well as a collector. And uh, he had hundreds of, of transactions, like maybe even approaching a thousand uh, NFT transactions. Uh, we were unable to determine which, what the buy prices are and the sell prices are. Because a lot of these, when you go to an exchange uh, to trade it, you might bid on the item. And that will, every time you bid, it's taking like ETH out of your wallet. So these, you, we see the ETH going out, but then uh, if you win the investment, uh, the, the purchase, then the uh, NFT gets assigned to your wallet, but we don't see that connected to the purchases that went out. We, they're not connected. This is an example of how it's not really some what's the blockchain could be better and the protocols could be better. So we can't necessarily connect those two. So in that situation, we aggregated all his purchases and we did a, a, a prorated cost on the total net of all his purchases. We could tell when he purchased things. We just couldn't figure out what he bought them for. So uh, however, we have another client who had like, you know, no more than 10 transactions and we could manually do that. But uh, NFTs represent, because they're all basically unique coins and they're not, the prices are, are not entered in very well. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's just, it's difficult. And what about the case where you can't sell the NFT? I guess you can't treat that as a rug pull or anything of a sorts because you still have the asset. Um, what is, is there anything that comes with that? If you want to sell can't... it and there's just no market for it, I guess. So say for instance, you've been actively trying to sell your NFT for the last year and nobody's biting, but you pay 10 ETH for it or something like that. Well, then uh, in that situation, uh, it's it, you, you basically have some sort of, you've lost, you have an unrealized loss. And the, at that point in time, as long as you still have that asset, then uh, you can't really write it off. Uh, the best thing to do is to sell it for a loss uh, and, and then you have a write-off. But let, until you dispose it, you really can't write that that off. Gotcha. Uh, Todd R, you want to come off camera and ask your question? Or off mute at least? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for doing this, Clinton. Um, looks like my video is not coming on, but I tried. Uh, thank you again for taking these uh, questions. I'm the one who asked about Singapore and um, maybe for keeping it on track with what you've already been speaking to. Um, I have two, two other questions. One is what would happen to the indefinite carry forward of capital losses in the event that long-term cap gain treatment goes away? So if we're carrying losses forward every year, we take a $20,000 loss, you can offset unlimited losses against uh, unlimited gains. However, in the future, let's say I'm carrying forward $10,000 of capital losses from prior years and I can take my $3,000 a year to offset in each future period what happens to those capital losses that I'm carrying forward if separate treatment for long-term gains goes away and now everything is just treated as income? 
Well, what's uh, in Congress right now is not that long-term capital gains goes away, but long that the long-term capital gains tax on uh, when your your net gain is in excess of one million dollars, that the tax rate is the same as the short-term tax rate, thirty-nine point six. That's what they're proposing. So, uh, but you would still have long-term capital gains up to the first million. Okay, so if you have uh, loss carry forwards, you know, they just get rolled into the whole picture, you know, so if you have loss carry forwards, you, you certainly uh, get rolled into the calculation of the net gain for the next year. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then also, you were talking before about how to best track these things with various tax programs that are out there. Right now, um, it certainly is a big challenge for the IRS. Um, however, the statute of limitations on income taxes is 10 years. So um, specifically with ICOs, it seems that people think they can hide behind a VPN nowadays and um, not get tracked. And certainly that hides their IP address but not their wallet address. What they've done on the blockchain is recorded in, in perpetuity. Don't you think that eventually they're going to get a way where they can go back and rebuild the history? You know, I transfer my coins from an exchange to a private wallet. Well, now that private wallet address is associated with my exchange address. They'll be able to go back and eventually link all these things together, rebuild the history and uh, potentially go after investors for not paying taxes in prior tax years. Do you think this is going to, become an increasing trend in the future? Um, yes, I think this is, this is the IRS definitely intends to do this. They have definitely gone after people using the Coinbase 1099 information. They've had a John Doe summons uh, against Kraken and Gemini, uh, Kraken and Poloniex uh, to, uh, to get their trading history for 2016 to 2020. This, they're going to go after people who didn't report. The IRS finally figured out that people made money in 17, they lost it in 18. So they're going after the Kraken and Poloniex data, which was never reported uh, to them previously, and they're going after them. So yes, that's how they're going to do it. Now, here's what happens in an audit. You know, they, they start out and they demand all the documentation, uh, all your records, all the transaction polls from your exchanges. They want you to list all the exchanges you're on. They want you to list all the wallets you used. Uh, for every exchange and everything you have. Now, I, uh, I have one client, uh, I, you know, we, who's just a consulting client. He, somebody else was representing him, but uh, he was a person who used the wallet. He, he was like a developer. He played with the wallet. He'd play with it, move coins in and out, throw it away, get another wallet, move things in and out, experimented with it. He'd get other wallets. He used a lot of wallets. He did not produce these addresses. When the IRS went back and they saw all these transactions of income coming to him from wallet addresses that he did declare, they said, we're going to treat all of these as income and we're going to tax you on them. You know, his position was, hey, they weren't income. They were my coins. I was moving them in and out, in and out. They were my coins. And they're saying, you never declared it as your uh, wallet address. Therefore, you know, we're not going to believe you now that you claim that. So uh, you get exposed. Uh, you're, you're, you know, when the audit starts, you want to divulge as much information as possible because it will come back to haunt you if you hold back. Uh, the the key thing on taxes is you're going to get discovered when you use the on and off ramps of like Coinbase, Crack, and Gemini to get your money in and out of cryptos. And that's how they're going to catch you moving things in and out. And then the kimono opens up. They ask for all your records. They do the, their own gain calculations. And if your numbers are underreported substantially, then you're quite exposed. Uh, the IRS has three years to audit your tax return unless you have... Uh, underreported your income by 25%, which is going to be typical for the crypto investor who's successful, in which case the statute of limitations is six years uh, from the date it's filed. So, you know, if you did, if you engaged in fraud, then you lose all uh, protection. So, uh, failure to report could fall into the category of fraud if they pushed it hard enough. So, uh, it's important to file your taxes. That starts the, the clock of protection for you. Thank you. That's great. Uh, and my last question, um, and I'll be quiet. Uh, thank you again for doing this. And what my question was regarding um, foundations is why you think that Singapore in particular for corporations has become such a popular domicile for foundations and um, these various projects that are divesting their IP into foundations 
in Singapore. Previously, it was the Caymans or perhaps the BVI route, uh, but now it seems that you know Switzerland was popular for a while. Now everything has moved towards Singapore, and I'm just wondering if you could just comment on why you think that's such a popular option. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Todd, for that question. And I should just take a, a second here, just mention, you know, you ask me questions, I don't pussyfoot around with the answer. I give it straight to you, my opinion. Uh, and that's what we do. And if, you know, people want to get our, hear more about my services, I'm the Crypto Tax Fixer on Twitter, on uh, YouTube, and, you know, follow our channels. If you want more information on our products and services, on our CryptoTaxAudit.com. Uh, uh, Singapore has become attractive uh because first of all hong kong is uh kind of come a place you, you can't really trust for running businesses and singapore is a very stable country has uh it does it has some very attractive intellectual property laws i saw that it's rated as number two in terms of intellectual property protection uh has no tax on capital gains the corporate tax rate is only 17 percent, which is very low it's extremely low uh, and foreigners can own 100% of a company. So uh, this is attractive to people outside of uh, you know, Singapore. Uh, it also has a strong banking system. And you know, as a banking system is not on the black list or the gray list, like a lot of the other countries you mentioned. So it is a place where I can move money in and out. I think that's why it's attractive. Uh, as a US person, uh, we, you should all know that there are anti-money laundering laws that if you have a, a financial interest in a foreign foundation or a foreign company, you have legal reporting obligations. There's no tax associated typically, uh, but uh, failure to file is a $10,000 penalty. It sort of starts. So I'll just mention that. But that's a great question. Thank you. And there's another question uh, about Puerto Rico uh, and their triple tax exemption. Um, so do you have any Thoughts on, on that? I have a lot of clients in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is very attractive. The upshot of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. Uh, and because they don't have representatives in Congress, uh, Puerto Rico collects all the tax for the federal government. Whereas like say in California, you pay to the IRS, you pay to California. But when you're living in Puerto Rico, you only pay to Puerto Rico. You don't pay to the US government unless you have US sourced income. When you move to Puerto Rico, become a Puerto Rico resident, take advantage of their Act 20, Act 22 uh, incentive programs, uh, then uh, the capital gains and income from your cryptos and dividends, uh, if, if that's applicable, uh, is taxed at a 0% rate. So a lot of wealthy people are moving down there uh, with the expectation that as their wealth continues to grow, they can enjoy it at a 0% rate. There is a, uh, a very complicated set of residency rules you need to be very careful about. You need to become a resident of Puerto Rico, you have to be there at least 183 days in, in a tax year. So uh, that uh, would be something you'd need to work out. But I have I have a slew of clients down there who are doing quite well if you want to avoid taxes. Uh, there was another question you gave me ahead of time was like about selling assets while you're living in California. Well, California, I mean, if you sell an asset, we talked about the crypto uh, long-term capital gains rates for most people around 15%. Uh, but then all that is then taxed, I believe, in California at about 13%. So you're doubling your taxes because you live in California. Uh, if you were living in Nevada or some other state, or you could claim residency that state that's a zero tax state, then you wouldn't be paying state taxes. Now, you go to Puerto Rico, you pay neither the state taxes nor the federal taxes on that portion of the gain that occurred while you're in Puerto Rico. So that's kind of how those all blend together. I mean, if you want to reduce your taxes, move to a cheaper state than California. Uh, and then, you know, secondly, if you want to reduce your taxes, uh, focus on holding your assets long-term to take advantage of the long-term capital gains rates, which is roughly 15%. Uh, for most people. Uh, and if you have a lot of wealth, then you might want to consider Puerto Rico. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, lot, lot to think about there. <laughs> uh, uh, so I got a question about uh, uh, mining. So Bitcoin mining or just crypto mining in general. Uh, so the question is, what if I use my Bitcoin to buy mining rigs? The transition, the transaction is fully done in Bitcoin without entering the fiat space. What are the tax implications of these types of transactions? That's fine. So under the tax code, all transactions are interpreted in fiat currency, U.S. dollars, right? Every transaction is reduced to U.S. dollars. If you were 
doing transactions over in Europe using euros, we express it all in US dollars for tax purposes, okay? So uh, I have Bitcoin, I sell the Bitcoin for a price. I experience a gain or loss on the disposal of that Bitcoin. It doesn't matter that I, I bought a mining rig for it or, or, or stable coin, it doesn't matter. So uh, whatever that US dollar value, the fair market value of US dollars of that Bitcoin at that moment is what I consider the sale price for the Bitcoin and the purchase price of your mining rig for depreciation purposes. Awesome. So we got another one here about airdrops. So whether that be NFTs or crypto. Um, so what are the tax implications of an airdrop or winning an NFT or crypto through a competition? The IRS came out with uh, a revenue ruling that said that the airdrops were taxable in at the fair market value in US dollars on the date that you receive them. That's the IRS position. There are some people who are disputing that. I've actually seen some legal uh, scholarly journals that dispute that. So it might be something that the courts will take up in the future. But in general, they're trying to treat that as income as you, re as you receive it. Awesome. And uh, gas fees. Uh, so can those be counted as a cost during tax filing? Or how do people, how should people be typically treating gas fees? And then also, uh, fail transaction fees where you still eat the cost of the transaction even though you didn't receive whatever you were trying to transact for? So the gas fees are, are a transaction fee that are deducted from the uh, proceeds of a, a transaction. And they're, so in other words, they reduce your, your gain on a transaction, right? So that's, that's how gas fees fit into the whole picture. If you have a failed transaction, uh, in that situation, uh, that's just uh, money under the dam. There's nothing, it's, you did not have a successful sale, therefore it's just lost money. It's just a loss on your part. There's no tax benefit from it. Gotcha, that is unfortunate. Um, cool, so we got about 10 minutes left. I'm um, gonna turn it over to you, Clinton. Uh, one, thank you so much for taking the time. I personally uh, learned a lot from both this discussion and the, uh, the previous one that I attended. Um, there were a lot of really good questions asked um, but if you want to take a chance, just tell us more about what you guys do and uh, kind of what your offerings are uh, over at Crypto Tax Audit. So uh, we're putting together tools to help as many people as possible at Crypto Tax Audit. So we're creating tools for everyone to use. So we have the membership service where we can monitor your IRS accounts on a weekly basis, to let you know when the IRS has flagged you for an audit. Secondly, we're putting out tools to teach you how to do your own crypto tax return, how to do you know, how to use a TurboTax, Tax Act, h and Block Online, h and Block Local Offices. These people do not want your business. They don't want to handle it. They don't want to handle liabilities. It's not a part of their game plan. Uh, uh, we, there's the, if you go to human tax preparers, two thirds of all tax preparers are not uh, registered with the IRS. Uh, it's a problem that the IRS has. They don't have a, a registration process, but two thirds of all tax preparers are unregistered. h and Block, Liberty Tax, uh, you know, anybody, mom and pop, you know, so you really fall down into a handful of people who are registered and accredited to do a tax return. Uh, the CPAs uh, in general don't uh, want to do crypto taxes. I did a seminar for them uh, and it was, I said 95% of CPAs didn't want to do crypto taxes. I was corrected by the other CPAs. I said, no, it's more like 99. Don't want to do it. And most CPAs handle business taxes, quite honestly. So, uh, you know, you're, we have a crisis in the tax preparation space. So we have a course on how to use a, one of the free file software products, the best one I've seen out there. And I don't even get any money for recommending it. It's a totally free file package called OLT, Online Taxes. And we show you how to use it to prepare and report your crypto taxes using our bulletproof methodologies. We, we're putting free resources out there to help people protect themselves from the IRS. Uh, go to Crypto Tax Audit, follow us on Twitter, on YouTube. Uh, I, we have a minute or two. I can race through some of these questions I see here on chat. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, please, please. Okay, questions, there's time. Okay, yes. If, if, one just trades via wallets like MetaMask and doesn't collect personal information. Uh, first of all, you're free as an American to trade on any one of those services. You're free to be on any ex crypto exchange in the world as long as it's not located in North Korea or Iran. 
All right. So you're free to do all those services. They might not want you because they don't want to have reporting obligations to the U.S. government, which is what we see with Binance and a lot of these other services like Ubi and, and some others that don't want Americans. And they're getting aggressive about not about ex, uh, expelling Americans. That's their problem. It's not your problem. Uh, if you do get kicked off an exchange, make sure you pull all your transaction records to protect yourself. How long can you keep extending taxes? Uh, uh, taxes are due on April 15th, usually, uh, and you could file a six month extension. You actually have to file it and it extends it to October 15th, uh, which is coming up here in, in six weeks. Uh, and that's, that's how long you have to file. Um, Binance, Binance 1099. Well, let's see. Uh, Eli asked about Binance 1099. Well, there's two Binances, or multiple Binances. Uh, Binance, uh, the original one, the international one from Malta, it will not be issuing a 1099. They hate Americans at this point. Binance, they did create a Binance US, and they will issue a 1099K, and you need to make sure you account for all the in income that they report. Uh, Binance US, Binance made a mistake, in my opinion, by creating a Binance US, because now Binance uh, uh, the U.S. is coming after Binance International uh, for breaking SEC rules and commodities trading rules. And and uh, if I might say this to everyone, uh, I mean, I got my law degree in international financial regulation. What's happening right now with Binance is that all the major countries in the world are jumping on their back regarding regulations and basically humbling that company to the ground. And... They, this is exactly what happened with the Swiss banks when they destroyed Swiss bank secrecy. Uh, so now we no longer have secret Swiss banks. Governments all over the world report back to uh, countries the account balances of their citizens. This is exactly what's happening. It's an international, it's a coordinated effort. Once Binance caves and agrees to report back to each country about the balances of their citizens have, you're going to see... Uh, almost all the other exchanges will uh, cave in to the same thing. At this point in time, these governments will be in possession of past history records. They will be able to go back and find out what you did on Binance in 2017 or, you know, 18, you know, before they were sharing the information. This is why, and I think Todd made the comment about uh, leaving records behind. Whenever we file a tax return, we are leaving digital fingerprints behind. When we trade on a market, we use a wallet, we're leaving digital fingerprints behind that can never be erased. So I highly recommend everyone to get, to make this coming year, uh, the year you report all your cryptos accurately. We can't always fix the past. And what I tell people to do is subscribe to our crypto tax audit service. We'll watch the past years for you. We'll let you know if the IRS is, is interested in them for audit purposes, but make this coming year, the year you do your taxes 100% correctly. And each year going forward, don't let yourself be hiding from uh, from uh, the IRS and have that destroy your entire financial future. Just make it this a good year and, and kind of outgrow these returns. Let the statute of limitations protect you as these returns age. That was my little hope. Taxing NFTs. NFTs, uh, 10 of, NFTs there is a law that says they're taxed at 28%, uh, but I don't think the IRS will figure out how, which ones are collectible, which ones wouldn't, but in general, they're treated as regular capital gains. Uh, if you're a trader, if you're a creator, then it's treated as a business. How is how are Grayscale uh, taxes treated? Grayscale is a, I believe it operates as a fund under U.S. securities laws. So it has different rules for treating that uh, uh, as the fund, but then they just report the net uh, results to you. Uh, so uh, it's a net result at the added to your tax. Uh, taxing fork as regular income never seemed to make sense. Do we have to go back and amend old tax returns for that? Well, hey, they come out with these rules years after, like, like the IRS came out with a private letter ruling on like kind exchange. All right. And this only applied to 2017 and before. Why did they wait till 2021? Uh, most of the people who filed their taxes in 2017, so I'd be like, say, April 8, April 2018, they filed them. There's a three-year statute of limitations. That brings us up to April uh, 2021. And then they published a letter in, in June saying that in 2017, the like kind of exchange didn't apply. Well, hey, they're like at least three months too late, all right? Nobody could even amend their tax returns. Why'd they come out with it now, 
right? In my opinion, it's, uh, it's a con. Uh, I believe it's a deception because I, I think the ruling is weak. It's intended to scare people who uh, would want to claim it for unreported other gains. So yeah, uh, you know, all these things that as we progress each year, the tax law is, is stressed and stressed to apply in a meaningful way against crypto trading. And, you know, it's going to all end up in the courts eventually. Um, NFT collectibles, I talked about that. I hope it's a helpful session. Our credit card rewards, good question on credit card rewards. Uh, credit card rewards are treated as discounts uh, uh, in general, like, because all the other, like, you know, American Express, MasterCard, Visa, they all would give you money back for buying something. Those are all discounts. So they're not considered income. All right. So, uh, or it's a re I shouldn't say discounts, they're rebates. So it's not income. It's not taking as much as money as you owe. So uh, don't have to pay taxes on those uh, until you convert them to fiat, in which case there might be a gain. Uh, let's see, helpful insight. What are the costs included excluded for investment expenses? Well, yeah, I think we talked about for investment expenses, all your transactional costs are written off. Um, for an individual investment management, consultation services and education, those are not written off. Uh, how do we track deck sales and gains? Very difficult. Uh, I would recommend uh, in terms of protecting yourself is to not use the same address all the time uh, for DeFi. If you have NFTs, keep them all in one address. Uh, if and you could do that with MetaMask, right? You, if you're going to be doing yield farming, keep that to one ETH address. If you're going to be doing uh, liquidity farming, put that. That way you're not blending them all together so that it's so tough to pull it apart. Uh, and by keeping fewer transactions, we can understand it better. Uh, the, the, probably the single biggest thing anybody can do to protect themselves in an audit is to begin a simple practice today using something really low tech, right? A pen and a piece of paper and every time you make a trade, you write down, on this date, I did this. This is considered a contemporaneous log if it's written at the time it happened. The courts put significant value on this, all right? So we talked about NFTs. I have no record of what I bought at the NFTs. If you'd simply write down, you know, on uh, September 2nd, I bid for this piece of art on Super Rare, and I won it at a certain price. Write that down by hand. You don't have to, you're not trying to, don't do a spreadsheet. Don't do a Word document because those can be faked, all right? But, but a pen uh, and paper are amazing. If you want to, go get a moleskin and do it that way and scan it in. But handwritten is your biggest defense uh, because, you know, two years from now, you have no idea what you did on, on September 2nd, all right? I have one client who went to an audit. All his trading he did after he'd been drinking a lot of wine. And he could never really tell me what he did or why he did it. So uh, he just knew he traded in everything. This is back in 2017. Well, we're, we're saving him a bundle uh, right now. We got him into appeals. He's going to do it. We got we to gotta come to a close. We're right at, right at time. But uh, hey, really appreciate you, you, Clinton. This is incredible. Uh, I know everybody here learned a ton. I'm going to uh, share all of your information, your, your website, your Twitter, uh, and all that with with the with the mailing list, um, and I've already gotten a bunch of people asking me for the recording for this, so we'll have this also posted to our YouTube. Um, but thank you all for coming out. This has been a great session. We actually have another session later today at two, which is um, on the Polka Dot ecosystem. So if you can join that, uh, you should have gotten an email about that previously. But thanks again, Clinton. This has been been great. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, CK. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Y'all have a good one.